Why are boutique investment banks trading at such low multiples? Well, look, I can only really speak for, for our company, and you're right. I, I've never heard a CEO think their company was trading at the right multiple, so count me in on that crowd. But look, all we're going to do is generate a great business model. We've, we've, since we've been public a little over two years ago, we've uh, returned almost 20% of our value in dividends and special dividends. That's what we'll keep doing, and I think the market will notice. Well, it's a competitive business, at you know, so I'm sure you feel competitive when it comes to things like valuations. What is it that investors aren't seeing when they value a dollar of your earnings at 12 times, when they put a 12x multiple on your earnings, but they're putting an 18x multiple on Houlihan and a 16x multiple on Evercore? Now, you could argue maybe that Evercore's got this asset management thing and that confuses stuff, but I want to know what you think. Now, a lot of it is, and again, I'm not an expert on, uh, on everybody else's multiple, but a lot of it is, we run a very clean business model, by the way. No leverage. We sit with substantial excess uh, capital. We have about over $200 million in cash on our balance sheet and no debt. And we do that to make our employees and our, uh, to attract managing directors, make them feel very comfortable about delivering long-term advice. We don't want them to think about the firm at all as, as their responsibility and so we keep a, an exceptionally strong balance sheet. Um, and then I think the other part is our model is clean. You'll see a lot of pro forma in those numbers. I think as the SEC has required people to do more straight gap accounting, I think you'll find that our valuation uh, is probably slightly better than you think because of the, how clean we run our model. Part of what I was getting at, uh, and maybe I didn't make it clear enough, is the idea that firms like yours with this clean business model are very much leveraged to the amount of activity that's taking place in mergers and acquisitions and restructuring. It's been tapering off, certainly on the M&A front, since 2015. Dollar volume is down by about 35% from for the fourth quarter. Fewer deals are getting done as well, and on average, they tend to be smaller. Does that trend continue? Possibly. Look, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball on M&A. I will tell you one thing. I've never seen the business community. But you've got a pipeline, and I don't. <laughs> so, look, I think the pipeline is actually strong. The, the, the conversations in the market, the amount of activity we see, the desire to do things, Eric, is as strong as it's ever been. The government's gotten a little more active on the antitrust front. Uh, the uh, inversion um, activity has stopped a little bit. So, so there's some things that always affect it. But let me tell you something. I'm, the companies that we talk to are facing a challenging, low-growth environment, and they need to do things to improve their business. And so the amount of conversation we're having is as, as high as it's ever been. The amount of conversations. So economic growth is challenging, but yet they have to do something. Does that mean that they're growing more comfortable with the idea of paying up? Because valuations are pretty rich right now. Yes, I think people, uh, you know, valuations have been here for a while. Um, and I said, I'm asked all the time about the confidence of CEOs. And I said, I believe the boards and CEOs are, are fairly confident now. When I say confident, they are confident that we have a low growth economy. Um, I think they are confident that there's nothing radical that will change uh, in the next few years that they can see. And so that they have to look at M&A as a real possibility of improving or, or spinoffs or, or things of that nature. So, yes, the, uh, the, the low growth economy is improving people's confidence and desire to do things. When uncertainty becomes certainty, if you will. Yeah. I, well, I think, it's, uh, I think people are really buying into the fact that if we have low growth, we may have low interest rates for a longer period of time than most people thought 10 years ago. Here's another thing that CEOs have to keep in mind. Uh, not this specifically, but the idea. Tony James, president of the Blackstone Group, told me yesterday that his firm is selling everything it possibly can right now because valuations are so rich, credit spreads are so skinny. Put yourself in your client's shoes for a moment. Would you be a buyer if private equity is running for the exits? I don't, you know, look, Tony James was a former partner of mine and uh, one of the smartest people I know, so I can't refute uh, Tony James. But look, there's always a buyer when there's a seller. People, you know, it's funny when I turn on Bloomberg sometimes and they say the market went down because there were more sellers than buyers. I always laugh because there's usually has to be a buyer for every seller. For every seller. So, uh, you know, I, I think there are still people who are trying to accomplish things, putting together synergies, market share. And by the way, Eric, there's a huge technology threat 
to almost everybody's business. What I find fascinating about my business, I get to talk to CEOs from a broad range of geographies, businesses, and it's always incredible to me what technology is doing to their business and how they have to respond and how threatening it is over the next five to seven years. What about political risk? How many of your clients would you say have told you they're holding off doing anything until after the election? I'd say zero. Uh, we, really? We, we've had some things people wanted to get done prior to the election, I think, um, but I know of nothing that I can think of that's being held off till after the election. What about preference? You could make the case, and many people do, that there's more certainty in a Clinton presidency, more of the same. She comes from the same party. She was a cabinet minister, obviously, secretary of state in the president's cabinet. But say, several of those same people, or others for that matter, could make the case that Trump could do a lot to improve conditions, at the very least for M&A, right? Deregulation, rewriting the corporate tax code, Protectionism, for all we know, could have a, call it, positive impact on the desire for deal making. What do you think? Well, it's interesting. It's actually a topic that is very, is tread upon very lightly this election, almost more than I've ever seen. I think people are nervous about uh, talking about their candidate preference. There are certain preferences they might have that they'd rather not talk about in public. So I think you put it well, there's a feeling that Hillary Clinton might be more predictable, but Donald Trump, uh, I was down at the business roundtable and Chris Christie came down and, and made a pretty good case that the first thing they're going to do is go after re the regulatory environment. And th there's almost no CEO, no industry that you can't find people worried about the, over bur the burden of uh, overregulation. And I think if he continues to address the business community on the burden of regulation and lowering the corporate tax rate, um, it, 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 he, he might find uh, some support in that industry. One of the big messages, if you will, uh, the words that Hillary Clinton likes to use is fairness. Right? She talks about it in the context of income inequality, but it also makes me wonder what posture the FTC, for example, and the Department of Justice might take under a Clinton presidency. What would you expect? You know, I don't know. Um, I think it was interesting. We've, we, we had almost two regulatory environments on M&A for the first five or six years in the last year and a half, something changed and we all of a sudden have a very, uh, I think a much more focused uh, uh, Justice Department on, on M&A and obviously the inversion legislation that was, uh, you know, put in place has chilled that environment too. So I, I, I don't exactly, I, I can't predict what uh, the Clinton FTC would look like. Do you think the FTC would be lighter touch? Do you think the DOJ would be more hands-off if Trump were the president? Look, he said that he thinks the regulatory burden is killing American business. I, I, those are, that is regulatory burden. I think he would. I haven't asked him directly. Now, let's go back to Ken Mollis, the CEO, as opposed to these other CEOs whom you have a chance to talk to all the time. What are the strategic priorities for your firm, based on what you were telling me, what you see happening to the economy, what you see potentially happening to regulation, maybe to the tax code, maybe your view on political and geopolitical risks around the world, what makes sense for Mollis and Company? Look, we've, we're committed to running a simple business, just advice, no sales, no trading, no research, nothing that gets in the way of partnering with a client. And that is all I focus on. I, I continue to believe that a relationship, a, a really fabulous relationship with your client is the most undervalued asset in the world. People want to do business with people they trust. It's a very hard world out right there right now to figure out who do you trust, who's not conflicted, who's confidential with your information, and who's thinking of you. And that's, we spend a lot of time from our, our most junior people to our most senior people reiterating long-term thinking and relationships.